This episode of Astronomy Cast is brought to you by Swinburne Astronomy Online, the world's longest running online astronomy degree program. Visit astronomy.swin.edu.au for more information. Astronomy Cast, episode 202 from Monday, October 11th, 2010. The planets at Gliese 581. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. Hi, Pamela. How are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Fraser? Doing really well. So uh, one thing that we wanted to to let people know, just people wondering, like, how can they help the show? Just a reminder, anytime you want, you can go to iTunes and uh, write a review for Astronomy Cast so that other people can see uh, that people like this show, especially, especially in other countries than the United States and the United Kingdom. So if you're in Australia or Ireland or Canada or New Zealand, South Africa, and even in other, you know, uh, some of the the countries that are that are not English as the main language, that would be a huge help. So just go to iTunes, search for Astronomy Cast and then write a review and uh, and that can help other people find out about our show. So if you could do that, that would be awesome. Okay, so with the discovery of a planet in the habitability zone of Gliese 581, the chances of, of finding life on other worlds is just getting better and better. Let's take a look at the discoveries made at Gliese 581 and provide some perspective on the real chances of life and talk about what might come next. Well, Pamela, let's, uh, let's first talk about just the, the system itself and the, sort of the discoveries that have gone on so far leading up to the the momentous announcement in the last few weeks if you could well this this is a star that has been studied for a long time for a lot of fairly straightforward reasons first of all it's fairly close this is the 87th closest known star system to the sun so that means that even though it's 20.3 light years away As faint as it is, we can get very accurate measurements of what this little star is doing. So uh, people started studying it, looking at its radial velocities. How does it move to and fro along our line of sight? Hopefully because it's getting yanked about by little worlds. And as early as 2007, these radial velocity curves, these measurements of its Doppler shifting, began to reveal that there was something pretty interesting going on in this system. Back in April of 2007, it was announced by Udry et al. It's not a star. There's a planet that's probably only one and a half times the radius of the Earth that's orbiting this one-third the size of the Sun star. So that was the first planet discovered around the star? That was the very first planet. But this was just the beginning. It was. And the more they looked at this little planet, the more and more little worlds began to crop up. Not actually that little. They'd be pretty big if they were in our own solar system. So as continued to look, um, new press releases slowly came out one by one, uh, indicating first a second planet, then a third planet, then a fourth planet, each one a little bit bigger and a little bit more interesting. Um, the fourth planet, Gliese 581e, which was announced a little over a year ago, back in April of 2009, it was estimated to have a minimum mass of just 1.9 times the mass of the Earth. And it's the lowest mass exoplanet identified around a normal star so far. So that was pretty interesting. I mean, just to for people to appreciate how complicated this is, right? The, the astronomers are using the radial velocity method, right? As we mentioned, this is how they study the wavelength of the light that's coming from the star as the star is being yanked back and forth towards us a little bit and away from us a little bit. And that shifts the spectrum of the light to the blue or or to the red. But this isn't, you know, with one planet, like a hot Jupiter zipping around the star, it's going back and forth really quickly. But in this case... You know, you're looking at five planets, six planets, and you have to each one is contributing a little bit of the signal. So it's like it's being pulled towards us, but it's also being, you know, zigged a little bit and zagged a little bit. And each 
one, they have to tease out that signal from the right. from the the wavelengths of the light. That, what a job! And this this is luckily a star that's at least doing most back and forth mov- movements on a fairly short period. So that first was found. Um, it had an orbit of just five point four days. That second planet that was found, it had a twelve point nine day period. And so here we have little planets getting discovered one by one. Um, But it started to get interesting with the second discovery. And what made the second discovery interesting was the planet they found they thought might have formed just beyond the frost line, just beyond the point at which water ice was able to survive the formation of the star. And then slowly migrated in until it was outside of the habitable zone, but still tantalizingly close that, well, maybe if the atmosphere was screwed up in all the right ways, maybe something interesting. And what about the other planets? Well, and slowly as we began to find them, they seemed to bracket the habitable zone where we ended up with planets that were just outside the habitable zone, just outside the habitable zone until the most recent discovery was made. So we had C, which was a little bit too far inside. We had D, which was a little bit too far outside. And these were both planets with masses, about six times the mass of the Earth. So potentially rocky worlds, potentially Neptune-like worlds. It's hard to tell at those mass, but just one side and the other of the Goldilocks zone, sort of like Venus and Mars, where atmosphere can matter, but there's probably no life. Right. That so the habitable zone. This is that sort of a, a an area like a ring, a band around the star, where you know inside that band it's too hot for for water to be liquid on the surface, and then on the outside of that band, water would freeze, and there's no chance that it could be liquid on the surface. But inside that band. You can have you can have theoretically liquid water, but it's more complicated than that, right? Right. You have to worry about well, first of all, is there an atmosphere? If you have no atmosphere, you have no magnetic field, ice that exists on the surface of the planet. Well, first of all, if if there's no atmosphere, there's no pressure. It's just going to sublimate away. Right. Fine. The moon is in the is in the uh, uh, the habitable <laughs> zone, right, of the sun. Right. And so, and there are many asteroids as well. And we're not looking for life on them. So as soon as you expose ice on these non-atmosphere containing worlds, that ice just sublimates away into gas. Now, if you have gravity, you might hold on to it. But if you have no magnetic field, the second the star flares the slightest bit, that flare activity is going to wipe away any atmosphere that's there. So you need enough gravity to hold on to an atmosphere, and you need a magnetic field to protect any atmosphere that you're able to garner. And if you've got those things, if you've got the mass, if you're within the habitability zone, if you've got an atmosphere, and if you have some kind of magnetic field, now we're cooking. Unless we cook too much, like Venus did. <laughs> right. <laughs> and right. So the, these planets, they can condemn themselves either way. They can either have too much atmosphere or too little. If you end up with an atmosphere that has too much methane, too much of, well, any of the greenhouse gases, um, too much carbon dioxide, uh, even too much water vapor, you can end up baking the planet so that liquid water doesn't exist in ways that are amenable to life. And so then the discovery of Gliese 581G, which, you know, normally we, we try to stick away, stay away from covering breaking news. But this is sort of a story that's been ongoing over the course of a couple of years. And I am certain we've not heard the last of, of this place. I mean, I'm sure there's going to be a lot more research coming towards it. So, right. so let's talk about sort of the discovery that was made and the announcement and, and what this means. So... A a series of observers have been very carefully from the surface of the Earth. That's one of the things I love about this discovery is they they were using Keck Observatory for a lot of their research. Take that, Um, Hubble. (laughs) Well, take that Kepler point. 
um, they they were very carefully uh, observing this little star, taking radial velocity measurements one after the other. Looked at this planet for a number of years, and they looked at it from the surface of the Earth using Keck for a lot of the observations, very carefully measuring all of these to and fro motions, pulling out, okay, here's the dominant curve. Uh, that would be the first object they found, B. Okay, let's take this high mass object at 15.6 Earth masses, fit the curve that it's causing in the radial velocity motion, remove that, look at the residuals. Okay, so now we have C cropping up at 5.6 Earth masses. Let's fit that with a curve, subtract it off. Work through all, they worked their way all the way through all the residuals for several years worth of data until what was left were residuals, little up and down motions in the velocity of the star that corresponded to a 3.1 Earth mass planet at a distance that is kind of laughable in our solar system. It's only 0.14 AU away from its sun, and it orbits every 36 and a half Earth days. Right, so 14% of the distance from the, the, the sun to the Earth is this planet's distance, and it's orbiting in just a few days. But still, it's in the habitable zone. And that is one of the really awesome things about this. So even though this, this object is orbiting at about half the distance of Mercury, the star that it's orbiting is a whole lot smaller than our sun. And by being that close in, it's able to have liquid water. Now there's some caveats on this. Gliese 581 is a red dwarf star. So this means in the early days of its life, it went through basically the terrible twos. It went through a phase of massive flare activity where it was sending out high energy bursts of light. And if Gliese 581G, this 3.1 Earth mass object, formed in that habitable zone, it would have been blasted rather violently for a little over a billion years. And that's not really healthy for life trying to form on a planet. Now, would a red dwarf star, I mean, we've talked about this before, the red dwarf stars produce these really powerful flares, like like proportionately more powerful than the sun or just more powerful than the sun did? They're, they're actually, it's a combination of duration and for their mass, they're proportionately stronger. So no, they're not stronger than what the sun was producing, but they produce more of the X-ray flares and they produce them for a much longer period of time. About bill, you're saying a billion years while our right. sun probably only did it for a few hundred million. Right. And and so with this billion years of violent UV X-ray high light, um, that basically would sterilize a planet. Now, one of the things that's theorized is we know planets move. We know that planets don't stay in the exact place that they formed. So what if this little Earth-like planet today might have formed further out away from the sun where it might not have gotten sterilized during this terrible two period of its home star. If this was able to happen, then may maybe um, any volatiles, anything like water, any gases that were a part of this planet's atmosphere might have survived. So that that's one possibility for allowing for an atmosphere and environment, allowing for life but we don't know. And that's so annoying. <laughs> now, you said it's that the planet itself has just over three times the mass of the Earth. How big is it then? Well, that's unfortunately something we can't actually get at. We, we don't see this planet transit its star. And, and when I say three Earth masses, that's actually the lower limit on it. It could actually be bigger than that if the orbit isn't much. Um, so it's we don't know its density and not knowing its density, we, we can only make guesses. It's, it's definitely going to be bigger than the earth, but how much bigger, we don't know. It could be the density of water. It could be the density of rock. But you're not looking at three times the size of the earth. Only it would only appear a little bigger. Well, unless it was made of ice. If it was made ice of, or snow or yeah. Yeah. Marshmallows. Um, <laughs> and then, and then if, and then in terms of gravity, I know, you know, once again, you're, even though it's 
the mass is a little over three times, because it's going to have a little, it's going to be larger, the gravity on the surface isn't going to be three times Earth gravity. It's going to be, it's going to be somewhere between one and 